The landing was the moment of greatest risk. If there were defending troops on the ground, getting ashore would be a bloody business. And for the hours or days it took to get the commander brigade established, the ships were immobile, vulnerable to air attack. For this critical moment, the transfer from sea to land, the Navy had to throw an air umbrella over San Carlos water, no matter what the cost. Without it, the whole operation would fail. There had been an elaborate attempt to confuse the Argentinians about what was going on. Raids all round the island, information leaked in London, they all pointed away from the idea of a single massive invasion. For an hour after dawn that Friday morning, there was peace and tranquility. The men got ashore unopposed and began digging in. It looked as though the plan was succeeding. The Falkland Islanders, stoical, undemonstrative people, greeted their liberators in a practical manner by repairing the flagpole. and, a little self-consciously, a Union Jack was raised. From now on, the islanders were to find themselves spectators at a battle fought for their benefit and waged all around them. The Argentinians had taken little notice of this small settlement until now, but within two hours of dawn, they started an unrelenting air attack. Canberra, large, white and obvious, made an inviting target. HMS Plymouth, assigned to protect, only just dodged two bombs herself. Attacking the warships, the Argentinians gave the supply ships time to unload and get the beachhead established. The first items ashore were the rapier anti-aircraft missiles. By the end of the first day they'd been set up, but they weren't yet effective. Delicate, precision equipment, it took time to settle and stabilise. Some idea of what the operator sees comes from this film of planes being shot down on the same day. It was taken through the sights of a frigate in the Falkland Sound. The attacks come at terrifying speed it needs slow motion to be sure what's happening.
The ship stationed at the entrance of the bay took the worst of the assault. Bombs being lobbed, a near miss. HMS Ardent was hit. She sank, 22 men died. After that first day, the defences were reassessed. Machine guns were strapped along the ship's sides. Even jets, when they dived below the missiles, put themselves within range. The Bofors guns aboard HMS Fearless claimed two planes. The gun crews, mostly 17 years old, soon had more battle experience than anyone else in the Navy. In the next major attack on the Sunday, HMS Antelope was struck. We saw a hole in each side, assumed a bomb had gone through without exploding. Many ships were having such lucky escapes. Then we realized the holes didn't match. There were two unexploded bombs on board. That evening, as a bomb disposal expert worked to clear it, one of the bombs blew up. Helicopters probed the darkness for men in the water or on the deck. We could just see some of the ship's company moving about, trapped between the cold water and the fire. Either could kill. The interference comes from the ship's radar. Then the fire took hold and the ship started to blow itself up. Antelope was the same type as Ardent. Neither survived a fire following a bomb going off. We were astonished that metal ships could burn with such fury but she didn't die easily. At dawn, she was still smoldering, but mangled beyond salvation. The British commanders had seriously underestimated the Argentine Air Force, committing its planes and its pilots with an almost reckless willingness. Frente a nuestra cámara, A4B, carreteando y saliendo, suponemos que hacia la zona de Malvinas. In San Carlos Bay, the helicopters ducked into the hillsides, using their colour as camouflage. But this time, the main attack was against the fleet at sea. <laughs> 